Welcome to the official launch of the Geofabrics Academy. It's my great privilege to present to you today the very first webinar for our new site, which has been specifically designed to provide concentrated education around geosynthetics, including raw material science, innovation and product development, the appropriate use of geosynthetics in design, with a specific focus on their interaction with geotechnical and environmental elements, their performance in application, durability aspects, uh, chemical compatibility, limitations, failure mechanisms, and much, much more. This first webinar is entitled The Development of a Hybrid Geosynthetic Clay Liner for the Attenuation of PFAS and Other Emerging Contaminants. My name is Daniel Gibbs, and I'm the General Manager of Technical Research and Innovation at Geofabrics Centre for Geosynthetic Research, Innovation and Development, also known as the GRID. Uh, today, uh, in terms of the learning outcomes, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of chemicals and emerging contaminants, their structure and usefulness, as well as the potential health implications with exposure. I think it's important to understand how we've tackled contaminants historically to give us a balanced view of how regulation may look into the future. Then we'll have a look at PFAS and its presence, uh, particularly in landfill leachates. Uh, following on from this, we'll discuss the various methods used to capture these chemicals, including some information on activated carbon and how that works. Then we're gonna delve into the development of a hybrid GCL and its performance, especially with respect to the attenuation of these types of chemicals. And finally, we're gonna wrap it up discussing a few test methods which can be used for MQC and CQA purposes for that hybrid GCL. Uh, and just a quick note about the grid research facility. We perform and have performed over the years a wide range of analyses on numerous types of geosynthetics in both simulated and real applications, uh, often using design and site specific inputs and materials. If you have any questions about the use or performance of any geosynthetic type, please reach out to us and we'll do our best to help you out. So to understand Firstly, the impacts of PFAS, we first need to understand a little bit about chemistry. Chemistry is the study of molecules, which are the building blocks of all matter. And perhaps more specifically, chemistry relates to their, their interactions with each other. The revolution in modern chemistry really began around the same time as the Industrial Revolution in the late 18th century. Since then, our fascination with molecular interactions has grown exponentially. Uh, this has created a wide range of useful products which permeate our everyday lives today. In fact, a study published by the American Chemical Society in 2020 noted over 350,000 chemicals and mixtures of chemicals have been registered for production and use with the US Health Department uh, estimating around 2,000 new chemicals being released every year. There's certainly a commercial aspect to producing these chemicals, but uh, that aside, I think generally we want to develop products which help um, the human race move forward. And if we take a look back through our most recent history, as in the last hundred years or so, we can see a range of products which were created to be helpful and in a lot of cases were, uh, at least according to the marketing anyway, uh, for example, radium was discovered in 1898 by Mary Curie and her husband, Pierre, after which it found multiple uses from liquid health preparations to luminous paint and watch dials through to a very popular energy drink that came in a 30 mil shot called Radithor in the 1920s. Its radioactivity and the resulting effect on the human body, more specifically the teeth and bones, became apparent later on. And as such today, uh, radium finds only very limited use. Asbestos also ended up in consumer products primarily as a fireproofing agent because it was believed to be a safe material until research in the 1960s confirmed it caused cancer and respiratory diseases. And up until the 1940s, some teething powders for kids contained mercury, which we now know to be quite toxic to humans. 
uh, especially in the form of vapors or methylmercury, which can result in Minamata disease with overexposure. In fact, the 1940s also gave us another wonder chemical called dichlorodiphenyl trichloroethane, commonly known as DDT. It was originally discovered in the late 1800s, but its insecticidal properties were not identified until 1939 by Swiss chemist Paul Mueller, who proved that DDT was highly effective in combating certain insects and uh, therefore insect-borne diseases for humans, such as malaria and typhus and that the effects also lasted for months when sprayed onto surfaces. And so it found widespread use across agricultural crops and livestock, uh, inside houses, and even directly applied onto humans to deter lice and mosquitoes. And it was very effective, at least for two decades or so, until the mosquitoes began building their resistance, which is certainly the case today uh, in many parts of the world. The widespread deployment of DDT, however, also raised questions as to the various ecological and environmental impacts. This was a particular focus for Rachel Carson at the time, who wrote the book Silent Spring, which focused on the negative effects of chemical pesticides. The release of this book really was the catalyst for the grassroots environmental movement at the time, and also the later formation of the US EPA in 1970. Since then, there have been many studies, both human and animal, which detail the negative effects on the human body in terms of DDT's neurotoxicity and the effect on the endocrine system, which we'll look at in a minute. So if we know that we generally aim for better living through chemistry, how can we determine whether a chemical is helpful or harmful? The answer, or at least part of the answer to this, is found in a quote by the father of toxicology, Paracelsus, who was one of the first scientists to really bring chemistry to medicine. And he said, everything is poison. There is poison in everything. Only the dose makes a thing not a poison. There's a wide range of naturally occurring chemicals in several fruits and vegetables, which are often part of the defense mechanism for the plant and in the wrong dose can be quite toxic to humans. But because they exist in these uh, fruits and vegetables in small amounts, they're rarely a problem for us. Like uh, solanine in potatoes, particularly green ones, uh, amygdalin in apple seeds, which degrades into hydrogen cyanide when you chew them. But again, in small amounts, they're well below the harmful dose. Equally, there are plenty of chemicals which are highly toxic in very low doses, both natural and also man-made. Which brings us to the endocrine system. The endocrine system is a complex collection of glands and organs, such as the thyroid and adrenal glands, that are responsible for regulating a number of critical bodily functions. They do this by producing and releasing a variety of hormones and steroids, which are chemical messengers, uh, in a similar way, I guess, to how the nervous system uses electrical messengers to convey information to various parts of the body. Um, the endocrine system is a very sensitive system and can be disrupted by certain uh, other chemicals, even at low doses. And we call these endocrine disrupting chemicals or EDCs. Uh, EDCs can increase or decrease hormone production. They can mimic hormones or alter the body's natural production of these. And because of how sensitive our endocrine system is, even very small changes to the way these chemical messages are sent and received can result in health problems. In these cases, low doses really do matter. We're constantly exposed to EDCs in our modern lives through the items which we interact with every day. Products containing phthalates, uh, BPA, flame retardants, parabens, etc. These things are either part of the manufacturing process and exist in a residual form, uh, applied to the external surfaces of products, or form part of the final product itself. Sometimes for good reasons too, like uh, making kids' clothing flame resistant, for example. These chemicals are in our cleaning products, our food packaging, our personal care products. And because a lot of these are generally at low dosages with no immediate impact, we tend to go about our daily lives 
never really realizing the compounding impacts these chemicals can have on our bodies over the course of many years. So what are we doing about all of these chemicals? How do we classify them? Well, to be classified as an emerging contaminant or perhaps more precisely a contaminant of emerging concern, uh, it needs to satisfy certain criteria, such as firstly, having a pathway into the environment, then it must present a potential unacceptable human health or environmental risk. And finally, in terms of regulation, it must have either no regulatory standards based on scientific research, or the standards uh, require updating due to emerging research. And as you can see, these are split into various categories, such as industrial chemicals, uh, pesticides, PCPs, etc. When we drill down even further, you can see here some of the examples. And PFAS aside for the moment, other chemicals which are gaining a little bit of notoriety uh, are things like brominated flame retardants, uh, prescription pharmaceuticals, and 1,4-dioxane. So now that we've categorized these, we can continue focusing our research efforts in understanding the various transport mechanisms and the fate and the human and environmental impacts such that we can then continue to develop appropriate regulatory standards. Okay, let's take a look at per and polyfluoroalkyl substances or more commonly PFAS. PFAS are a group of chemicals which are effectively made up of a hydrophobic carbon fluorine chain connected to a hydrophilic functional head group. With the carbon fluorine bond being one of the strongest in organic chemistry, some of the more salient properties of PFAS include uh, being repellent to water and oil, and some of them also have very extreme uh, thermal stability, hence their historical application in firefighting foams. This was uh, really a very clever application, which has no doubt saved thousands of lives over many years. Uh, and because uh, PFAS have got these unique qualities, the result has been the development of a wide range of chemicals over the last 70 years, employing this carbon fluorine bond. And so we've seen widespread uh, production and application, which have again proved for the most part to be very useful to humans such as non-stick cookware, one of the greatest inventions ever if you like eggs, uh, fabric, furniture, and carpet stain protection applications, food packaging, uh, as well as for a range of critical industrial processes, like the production of the silicon wafer used in semiconductors, which um, are used in a wide variety of electronic equipment today. So I don't think we'll ever have zero production of all types of PFAS. I, I think it'll come down to the manner in which they're regulated and this will be based on the associated risks, uh, risks to humans and the environment. Unfortunately, because we are constantly exposed to a wide range of chemicals in our everyday lives in small doses, and the fact that there are so many PFAS in existence, um, almost 6,000 now, uh, it makes large scale epidemiological assessments on individual PFAS extremely challenging. What we do know is that Generally, at least for the longer chain variants, which have been studied, such as PFOA, uh, they're very persistent in the environment. Um, some of them can be very mobile, highly mobile, particularly the shorter chains. Uh, they resist environmental degradation, and perhaps more importantly, they can bioaccumulate, uh, bioaccumulate, which means our bodies absorb them faster than we can excrete them. And this means that they can also biomagnify through the trophic web. Um, They've also been linked to the development of certain cancers, and in particular, those organs which are responsible for cleansing the body, such as the liver and kidneys. And certain PFAS have been nominated as endocrine disruptor and immunosuppressant chemicals, uh, particularly in children. And there's some international studies available on that specific topic. Now let's have a look at some of the nomenclature for completeness. PFAS are generally grouped into polymers and non-polymers. Mostly when we talk about PFAS, we're talking about non-polymers, which are highly mobile. These are split into per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, per being a complete substitution 
of hydrogen atoms for fluorine atoms in the tail, while poly, meaning only some of the hydrogens have been replaced with fluorine. Then further, generally we talk about PFAAs and its subgroups of PFCAs and PFSAs. When we talk about carboxylates and sulfonates, we're talking about their anionic forms, which have a negative charge on the head group. This is the form in which they generally exist in the environment. Their acid counterparts mean that the negative charge has been balanced by the addition of a hydrogen atom on the head group. Looking further, column X in this table refers to the total number of carbon atoms in the molecule, including in the head group in the case of the PFCAs. This is similar to the way we categorize alkanes in organic chemistry. So buta meaning four carbons, penta meaning five carbons, and so forth. And column Y refers to the functional group in either its anionic or acid forms, as I mentioned. Sulfonates having a sulfur atom in the head group and carboxylates having a carbon atom in the head group. And that's important when we describe them in terms of their chain length. Long chain sulfonates or PFSAs having six or more carbons and short chains having less than six and long chain carboxylates or PFCAs having seven or more carbons and the short chains having less than seven, uh, six of which are fluorinated. Then there are also ultra short chain molecules like trifluoroacetic acid, which has been suggested, suggested may be a degradation product of chlorofluorocarbons or CFCs, as well as precursor, precursor fluorotelomers like 62 FTOH. So now that we've reviewed some of the language that we use, let's have a look at some of the ways PFAS find their way into the environment. They can be directly released from manufacturing sites which use these fluorinated chemicals in the production process. Um, in agricultural crops which have been irrigated with wastewater containing PFAS, uh, aqueous film forming foams of course, and consumer products containing PFAS like carpets, food packaging, ski waxes, etc. as I mentioned. And let's not forget the major exposure path into humans for these chemicals is ingestion which includes consuming contaminated food or liquids or simply breathing contaminated dust, which can accumulate inside our houses and offices where we tend to spend large amounts of our time. Okay, so then it makes sense if we have a wide range of consumer products uh, either being made using these compounds or within the products themselves that at the end of their usable life, they're going to be destined for landfill. And that's what we see when we look at the various waste streams. Municipal solid waste containing our cosmetics and personal care products, uh, carpets, cleaning agents, polishes, pizza boxes, the list goes on. CMD waste, uh, which has concrete, which can act as a sponge with PFAS, sealants, coating, um, coatings, etc., through to commercial and industrial waste, things like industrial textiles, medical products, paper and packaging, that sort of thing, and also other contaminated wastes. So with all of that incoming waste, it became critical to generate some guidance around acceptance criteria for landfills, which we now have thanks to the development of the PFAS National Environmental Management Plan, or NEMP, currently in its second version by the heads of EPA in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, this document gives practical guidance around the maximum acceptable levels of the three most studied long chain PFAS with different levels applied to the different types of lining systems uh, used by the landfill. For single composite line landfills, which are currently the most popular design, the maximum allowable leachable, leachable concentration for uh, PFOS and PFHXS, either individually or combined, is just 0.7 micrograms per litre in liquids or 50 milligrams per kilo in solids. And for PFOA, up to 5.6 micrograms in liquids and again, 50 milligrams per kilo in solids. Now the acceptance criteria can be easily applied to relatively uniform bulk loads like excremented soils uh, prior to acceptance. But when it comes to MSW waste or certain CND waste, pre-acceptance testing is very difficult to near impossible. 
So the only visibility we have on PFAS in these cases is to look at the levels in leachate from the current waste stream to provide some lining design guidance for the construction of future cells and leachate ponds. Landfill leachate is a complex matrix of organic and inorganic, inorganic chemicals, which can make testing for these PFAS analytes a little more challenging than standard groundwater analysis. Still, there are a couple of standardized test methods which are employed by labs, including direct injection or whole bottle extraction, both of which give us a reasonably accurate picture of the amounts of PFAS in these liquids. Uh, the accuracy, of course, all comes down to the concentrations and the co-contaminant loading, particularly. There were some very interesting findings from a research study which was carried out by Christy Gallen and her team, which looked at quantifying the levels of certain PFAS across a range of Australian landfill leachates. And what they found was that all landfills in their study had measurable levels of PFAS. Operating landfills had higher concentrations, and these were dominated by more short chain than long chain PFAS, and in particular PFHXA, which is formed as, as a result of the breakdown of certain chemicals used in grease proofing for food contact materials um, and also stain resistance in textiles. It's also interesting to note that CMD waste overall had higher PFAS loadings than MSW waste. And those findings are generally supported by our own assessments here at the grid, where we saw higher levels of shorter chain PFAS in landfill leachates than uh, such as PFBA and PFBS, um, which are C4s, uh, higher than their C8 counterparts, PFOA and PFOS, with a generally higher loading of carboxylic acids, which are represented by the blue bars in this graph. The other interesting point here is that all but one of these leachates met the maximum criteria for PFOA, according to the NEMP, and all but one failed the maximum criteria for the sum of PFOS and PFHXS. So with known amounts of PFAS in our landfill leachates, which we know can concentrate with time, looking after these landfills is critical with most environmental authorities requiring at least 30 years of post-closure care. Now, while landfills remain open, they're subject to infiltration by rainfall, and this, of course, is the primary source of leachate generation. However, how much leachate is actually generated after the landfill is capped and closed? The good news from a leachate collection and treatment point of view is that leachate generation has been shown to slow dramatically post-closure. And in the case shown here of a landfill in Glades County, Florida, a significant reduction occurred within two years post-closure and fell to minimal levels after just seven years, assuming the cap is appropriately designed and installed, of course. Uh, obviously, this may not be the case for all landfills, but it certainly gives us some insight into how long leachate may need to be managed. In Australia, an acceptable uh, landfill liner and cap design include a single composite liner consisting of either a compacted clay or a geosynthetic clay liner overlain by a geomembrane. The improvement in hydraulic performance of this composite lining system over and above these individual components is well documented. But what about PFAS? Recent work carried out by researchers here and overseas have shown that while PFAS can form micelles at higher concentrations and reasonably readily diffuse through HDP geomembranes, this is likely not the case for the concentrations we find in landfill leachate, which are in the micro to nanogram per litre levels. There's a body of work being undertaken at present here in Australia, which looks to quantify the effects of PFAS on lining materials, such as HDP geomembranes, as well as GCLs and their synthetic components. Uh, this will include looking not just at how these chemicals move through the system, uh, but also any detrimental effects such as stress cracking, which may occur over time with exposure to PFAS contaminated liquids. But based on our current body of knowledge, let's assume that the PFAS quantities in landfill leachate are low enough to reduce their transport through HDPE geomembranes to very low levels. 
But what happens if the GM membrane has a defect or a hole, which should be considered during the design phase? Then diffusive flux, which is still important, turns into advective flux. And we now need to understand how liquids containing PFAS interact with the GCL components in terms of the impact on hydraulic performance and whether or not they are trapped in the bentonite and synthetic components. Now, if we look at bentonite, it's generally pretty good at trapping certain contaminants, such as heavy metals. Um, but what about PFAS? So I suppose to really understand that, we need to do a quick review of the composition of a GCL. GCLs comprise a thin layer of sodium bentonite, which is sandwiched between two textiles, um, which have been bonded or more commonly in, in Australia, needle punched together. This provides the internal reinforcement of the GCL, which is critical for stability purposes. They're manufactured dry, but the bentonite component swells dramatically when in contact with weak solutions or solutions having nominal pH and a low ionic strength such as water. They're rolled out on site similar to a roll of carpet and they're overlapped to create a hydraulic barrier. And as we've discussed, are uh, often used with overlying geomembranes to provide a composite barrier. The key component in the GCL providing the barrier function is the bentonite and more specifically the montmorillonite, which is the active component of the bentonite. Montmorillonite is a swelling two to one layered dioctahedral smectite comprised of two tetrahedral sheets of silica sandwiching a central octahedral sheet of alumina. Due to a process called isomorphous substitution, where you have a lower charged structural cation, such as aluminium, replace a higher charged cation, the result is a net negative charge, which other cations, such as sodium or calcium, are attracted to. We call these exchangeable cations, and they sit between individual clay layers, and they facilitate hydration and swelling. So when we have a look at how bentonite actually works, it's made up of individual layers which link up to form quasi-crystals. And depending on the valence or charge of the associated cation, the stacking size and the size of the quasi-crystal will change. Sodium, being a single valent cation, has a much smaller stacking size than, for example, a calcium cation, which is divalent. This is an important characteristic when we talk about permeability as the larger or agglomerated stacks, such as those you'd find in calcium bentonite, will tend to aggregate, uh, creating less tortuous flow paths. Sodium montmorillonite is well positioned to provide highly tortuous flow paths, as it has the combination of uh, a high porosity, but a low interconnectivity of those pores, which results in the bentonite being able to hold a lot of water, but also have a very low permeability. And we test that permeability of a GCL and the compatibility of different solutions with GCLs using ASTM D6766. This method has specific criteria in terms of confining and hydraulic head pressures and is used to compare the performance of GCLs in contact with liquids other than pure water, which is covered by ASTM D5887. A 100 mil diameter sample of GCL is sandwiched between two pieces of filter paper two porous stones and two end caps. Then it's sealed using a flexible membrane, which can be latex or neoprene or butyl rubber, um, depending on the compatibility of the liquid you're testing. And then this setup sits inside an outer chamber, which is filled with de-aired, de water, uh, which provides the required confinement to the system. In standardized tests, liquid is forced upward through the GCL from the base and collected from the top with flow volume, volume measurements uh, taken over time. In the case of other liquids, two dual chambered isolation cells are introduced either side of the GCL sample uh, to allow a wide range of liquids to be pushed through the GCL without compromising the panel or fouling the pipettes. The specific set point values nominated in these methods in terms of the confining pressure and hydraulic head pressures um, were originally set with quality control in mind, 
more so than around specific performance criteria in end use applications. The pressures were selected to ensure the specimen could be confined and back pressure saturated uh, using a hydraulic gradient that would produce a flow rate so that measurements uh, could be made in a reasonable time period. Um, and this was particularly important for QC and commercial labs. Um, these specific pressures were reached by consensus at the time and only meant for comparing the performance of one GCL specimen to another based on the standard. And as you can see by these examples given here, while the less than five or less than three by 10 to the negative 11 meters per second has now been embedded into industry specs uh, for over 20 years based on a deionized water test, it's important to consider that actual hydraulic flux will change depending on the application and particular site conditions, including the changes to overburden or confining stress, changes in hydraulic head pressures, and the composition and concentration of the permeating liquid. So for example, while the confining pressure may be similar in a landfill cap uh, to these in the method, if you have a relatively medium to low permeability soil in conjunction with a geocomposite drainage layer over the geomembrane and a mild slope, your hydraulic head potential is reduced to almost nothing. And your basal line is likely to perform much better as well, given the much higher confinement and lower head pressure. A leachate pond may be the closest thing you'll get to these test values, but with more confinement generally, uh, depending on depth, but also a higher hydraulic head potential. Here are a couple of graphs showing the hydraulic conductivity of a standard versus a polymer modified GCL, uh, both permeated with two different leachates containing what I'd call reasonably typical or representative levels of PFAS as far as landfill leachates go. Leachate A gave a final hydraulic conductivity values of between four and a half to six by 10 to the negative 11 meters per second for both GCL types, which is quite good. And after around nine and a half months, Leachate E returned values for both GCLs between one and two by 10 to the negative 11 meters per second, which really is excellent. And this falls in line with many of the Australian landfill leachates we've tested over the years. So hydraulically, we see that PFAS itself, at least at these microgram and nanogram levels, don't seem to affect these GCLs in terms of their hydraulic performance. But what about their ability to trap PFAS? In some of our early research studies in 2017, we quickly discovered that the bentonite core, while it generally has a reputation for trapping a range of heavy metals and organic contaminants uh, due to its structure, uh, its charge, its surface area, et cetera, it couldn't trap these molecules very well in either standard or modified forms. And some of the uptake you see in these graphs, particularly for PFOA, could also be linked to sorption onto the polypropylene synthetic components, uh, which we're investigating uh, at the moment in a cooperative study with Monash Uni. Uh, so this could be included in a future webinar. So I guess the question is, how do you trap PFAS? Well, there are some products uh, available which can trap them, a number of which have been successfully employed by water treatment plants for many years. Let's take a look at a couple uh, focused through the lens of their practical use inside a GCL. Iron exchange resins are a good example of uh, an engineered product specifically designed to trap PFAS. The hydrophobic tail can get trapped in either the polystyrene polymer or the divinyl benzene crosslink, typically through um, weak van der Waal forces, or the sulfonate or carboxylate head groups can replace an exchangeable counter iron, which leaves them attached to a fixed iron in the bead. The benefit here is that, at least for some of the well, more well-known PFAS, uh, these beads can capture both long and short chain. The challenges for these beads is that their efficiency reduces uh, relative to the concentration of competing charged organic and inorganic compounds in mixed matrices, including nitrates and phosphates. And they need to be wet, like 30% wet. They actually feel a little bit like wet sand, only less abrasive. 
Naturally, with respect to the development of the GCL, at least, which has a highly hygroscopic powdered bentonite core, mixing moist beads in just doesn't work. You end up with a coagulated mess. Given the negatively charged head groups as they're generally found in nature for PFAS, as I mentioned before, uh, engineering a cationic polymer with a positive charge, uh, such as polyamines or polydadmac, as an example, uh, makes a lot of sense as these can form elect electrostatic attractions with the head group, effectively trapping them in the chosen media. And because of the strength of that attraction, in some cases, the desorption is also quite low. These polymers can also be effective at attenuating both long and short chain PFAS as well similar to the ion exchange resins. The downside in terms of inclusion in a GCL and more specifically a polymer modified GCL containing anionic polymers is that the beneficial effects of these uh, negatively charged anionic polymers such as wet dry cycling performance, uh, enhanced gel state and, and the like may be canceled out by the positively charged cationic polymers. There may be some benefit in using a polymer with both uh, positive and negative charges, which are called zvitterionic polymers, but uh, we've not specifically researched these up to this point. Instead, our efforts have largely been focused on activated carbon, as it's one of the most well-known and well-researched products available uh, for the attenuation of organic contaminants such as PFAS. It has a very high affinity for hydrophobic compounds, which is why it works reasonably well to capture a range of PFAS given their hydrophobic tails. The extent of the adsorption is proportional to the specific surface area of the activated carbon. So having one with a very high specific surface area helps with uh, total contaminant loading capacity and the speed of uptake. Given the increased mobility of some of the shorter chain PFAS, one of the challenges is that activated carbon may not always effectively capture and hold some of these as long as the longer chain variants. And it's dusty with a low density, uh, so really quite tricky to handle through the manufacturing process, particularly when it starts flowing. As you can see in the picture, it can strip a range of contaminants out which is evidenced by the relatively clear water sitting above the bentonite carbon mix in container C on the right. Um, and after this was mixed and left to sit overnight. These were fluid loss tests that we prepared. So let's take a closer look at adsorption and how it works. Adsorption is the attachment of ions, atoms, or molecules, and these can be in liquid or gas form, they attach to the solid surface of an adsorbent such as activated carbon through these weak electrostatic forces such as van der Waals. So it really is a surface phenomenon as distinct from absorption, which, which is a bulk phenomenon where molecules are drawn within and become part of the absorbent material. The bonding can be either via physisorption, which is a direct physical connection, uh, governed generally by weak van der Waals forces, as I mentioned, um, or it can be via chemisorption, which is a chemical connection associated with the charge of the molecule and is typically the stronger form of connection. The large network of pores and the variety of pore sizes, which we'll touch on in a minute, make activated carbon an excellent adsorbent. Now, to give you a visual of what this looks like, I want to play this video produced by Dr. Beckman. This is a video which is available on YouTube. Um, showing the process of activation. Uh, it's produced in various forms. Um, this is an individual particle showing the macropores, mesopores and micropores, which we'll talk about in a minute. And here we see the adsorption process in action with a range of particles sticking to the pores like a magnet. And it's also used in um, quite a wide variety of industries, but uh, I suppose most notably in water filtration applications. So now we know uh, 
the mechanisms behind activated carbon, how do you pick the right one? Well, commercially, these are produced at scale from things like wood, coconut, and coal, but you can also use waste materials such as apricot kernels and cherry pits. Different donor raw materials and to some extent different processing techniques result in different properties in the final product, such as specific surface area and porosity. Now, porosity for these products is categorized in terms of their differing sizes, from tiny micropores, less than about two nanometers in diameter, through to mesopores, which range from two to 50 nanometers, and macropores, which are above 50 nanometers. Activated carbon made from wood generally has a larger number of macropores, while coconut shell-based activated carbon has a higher level of micropores. Coal is somewhere in between these two with a reasonably balanced porosity, having similar levels of each pore size. A further distinction is the type of coal used. Research has shown a higher PFAS attenuation capacity using bituminous coal over the younger lignite or older anthracite types. So with that knowledge, we selected a particular coal-based activated carbon uh, which had already been designed by the manufacturer to assist in the capture of PFAS molecules. And we recently carried out a kinetics and adsorption isotherm study through ADE to understand and really quantify the performance of this activated carbon with landfill leachate um, in isolation of the bentonite component. We used leachate A as the contact liquid because we had a lot of information on it and specifically because it had a range of potentially fouling co-contaminants. So we wanted to see the impact of these as well on the sorption kinetics. We looked at two different grades of the same activated carbon product, one with a slightly lower overall surface area. So one of them had around 1300 square meters per gram and the other had just over a thousand square meters per gram. And this study involved things like reaction rates, equilibrium times using increasing amounts of activated carbon, desorption rates using pure water, which was more of an index test as you'd really have such a strong solvent like milliq uh, in application, um, trying to pull things back out. Um, the main four PFAS which we assessed were two short chains, PFBA uh, and PFBS, and two long chains, PFHXS and PFOA. This is based on the fact that they had uh, the highest levels in the matrix. There were a range of other PFAS in there, but they were all at lower nanogram levels. You can see from these graphs that an increase in amounts up to 500 milligrams or half a gram addition rate uh, resulted in higher sorption. The CE on the y-axis represents a mass of solute remaining in solution per liter. So not much difference here actually between the two grades. If we look at this represented in another way, you can see in these two graphs, the removal efficiency percentages of each of the solvents up to again, half a gram application rate. Overall, the PS1300, which has a higher surface area, had a slightly quicker uptake of these specific PFAS coupled with slightly lower desorption rates. In its end application inside of GCL, in a landfill setting and at an application rate of say a thousand times higher than this study, so around 500 grams per square meter, there may not be a significant difference in performance over the longer term between the PS1000 and the higher grade PS1300. Naturally, it had been uh, on the actual contact patch of liquid hitting the GCL. So if, for example, you've got a single pinhole leak in the overlying G membrane, and there's fairly good intimate contact between the geomembrane and the GCL, and it creates a saturated patch underneath uh, in the GCL of say uh, around 200 millimeters diameter, then at an application rate of just 500 grams per square meter of activated carbon, you'll have between 15 and 16 grams uh, actively working in that, that zone, capturing these contaminants over time. And it depends on the hydraulic head and the confining pressure, of course, as we discussed earlier. So just to summarize the findings of this report, which was quite comprehensive, the removal order was PFHXS followed by PFOA, which you'd expect as there was less of these two longer chains in terms of their concentration. And we know also that longer chains are more readily trapped 
and uh, generally less mobile than the shorter chains. This was followed by uh, PFBS and then PFBA, which also supports other research showing the high mobility of PFBA and some other short chain carboxylates over the sulfonates. The bulk of the sorption occurred within 24 hours, which is uh, an important feature for activated carbon, and certainly from a water treatment perspective, uh, which is far shorter than what you'd practically need in a landfill lineup, but perhaps it's ideal for leachate ponds. The short chain adsorption isotherms indicated multi-layered adsorption or stacked adsorption, which can result in higher desorption levels under the right conditions. Long chain desorption was lower or better than the short chains. Both sorbents were very effective at trapping the long chains, but at these low doses were less effective with uh, the shorter chains, which would make sense. But still, even at half a gram addition rate, even the more difficult PFBA achieved around 80% removal, which is still excellent. Naturally, a change in solution chemistry may affect this for the better or worse, which is why targeted assessments are always recommended prior to product selection and design. So we selected an activated carbon with the right properties and the right particle size uh, and moisture content, et cetera. But how did we integrate it inside a GCL? Let's take a look at the development of what we call sorb seal or our hybrid GCL. Prior to us spending around $1.5 million on upgrading the equipment, we ran several small laboratory trials and then some larger scale online trials to qualify the product and the amount required uh, of activated carbon to get the right balance between maximum PFAS absorption and GCL permeability using landfill leachates. So when it came to design the equipment, we knew how much activated carbon we wanted to have per square meter, uh, how we wanted to mix it, and whether we wanted a selection of other potential materials to be added as the body of research around PFAS isolation uh, grew and material science grew, both in our lab and generally around the world. New information on material performance uh, and so forth. So we added three separate large hoppers for the powders and uh, also two special smaller micro dosing units for any polymers, um, which we found to be effective in trapping PFAS. The large mixing unit was fabricated in Italy, uh, tested and then sent over, we installed an automated sampling unit as well as a new core loading and rolling system, which gave us a longer roll length capability. And all of this resulted in a great deal of future proofed manufacturing and product design flexibility. We came up with the name, Sorb Seal, an icon. Um, we wrote a detailed patent covering the manufacturing process and um, a wide variety of final product combinations, all with a very specific focus on contaminant retention. So if we now look at the long-term hydraulic performance of Sorb Seal over a few years, we can see a slight increase in permeability overall than in the standard Elco Seal products but still in the 10 to the negative 11s, which is very good. These particular sorb seal GCLs had a typical addition of around one kilo per square meter of activated carbon and between four and four and a half kilos of dry bentonite. As I mentioned earlier, the PFAS in both leachates doesn't appear to have had a detrimental effect to the hydraulic performance. Uh, and I suppose going into this, we really wanted to keep the traditional GCL design techniques in place. We didn't want to disrupt the components of the GCL too much, such that then we'd need to rethink how we design with a completely new material or a certain aspect of the material. So we know it can retain good hydraulic performance over the long term, but how about the other critical aspect, the attenuation performance of PFAS over time? Well, that was very good too especially given that, again, MSW landfill leachates are a chemical soup which contain a wide variety of co-contaminants alongside the PFAS, which uh, all, all of which are competing for space on the surface of the activated carbon. 
The left hand graph here shows Sorbsil's ability to strip the leachate of a range of PFAS, long and short chain. On the right, we can see the performance of an Elkacil polymer modified GCL without any activated carbon, showing some attenuation performance, but not nearly as efficient as the Sorbsil product. So if we just focus on the three main long chain PFAS uh, nominated in the NEMP currently, we can see that the sorb seal is able to reduce the originally high levels of PFOS and PFHXS, which were outside even the seven microgram maximum, uh, microgram per liter maximum for a double line system to less than 0 0.03 micrograms per liter after 50 pore volumes of flow. Remember, this is permeated using actual leachate and the conditions of the ASTMD6766 GCL permeability test method representing 1.5 meters of simulated hydraulic head, uh, relatively low confining pressure as well. Uh, this means that in a landfill baseliner and cap where pore volumes through the GCL are likely to pass through more slowly due to either increased confinement and or a lower hydraulic head potential, and the fact that leachate generation slows down dramatically post closure, sorb seal may very well continue to provide attenuation of PFAS both during the operational phase and for many, many years post closure, even beyond the moment leachate stops being generated. Naturally, this is dependent on the original PFAS concentrations in the liquid, the, the levels of co contaminants, uh, the other line of design elements, such as the geomembrane and how well these products were installed and CQA, etc. But this data certainly proves it can be done. And on the topic of CQA, let's take a look at the specification for Sorbseal S1000 and S2000 GCLs. As I mentioned earlier, we purposely preserved most of the well-known properties of the Elkaseal GCL range in terms of the bentonite properties, uh, the synthetic component masses, uh, free swell fluid loss, of course, remain in line with industry standards. Uh, we lifted the dry bentonite mass component of the S2000 to a MARV of 4,000 grams per square meter, which matches the S1000 product now. And that's in line with our research, ensuring that we preserve the very low permeability. We've also slightly lifted the hydraulic conductivity to a MARV of less than 5 by 10 to the negative 11 meters per second, based on the data we've collected to date. And this is an industry standard value around the world generally anyway. So this could change, but that's where it's sitting at the moment. Uh, remembering that that's a deionized water hydraulic value, not a leachate value, which could change depending on the constituents and the concentration of the leachate. So that leaves the main additions to the specification being around the activated carbon itself. So we've added six new tests here, which are largely MQC tests that are carried out on every batch of the activated carbon, which depending on the addition rate could cover several thousand square meters uh, of GCL. So please keep this in mind when specifying test frequencies. One of the most well-known tests on activated carbon is called the iodine index or the iodine number, which we'll look at in a little more detail in a minute. Other than that, the other properties are really there to tell a story um, and prove the origins and quality to some extent of the activated carbon. For example, low ash in the range of say three to five can indicate coconut shell uh, activated carbon, but it's also indicative of acid washed coal based carbon. In terms of ball pan hardness, coconut shells harder in the order of 98 to 99 and more dense than coal, which ranges from 0.4 to around 0.54. So if you look at the combination of hardness, ash and density, you can use these values to determine the origin um, of the activated carbon. The ID number is useful in quantifying the specific surface area or reactive potential of an activated carbon in a similar way to how we use um, methylene blue adsorption to calculate the cation exchange capacity of the bentonite. There's a reasonably close relationship uh, of the amount of iodine absorbed representing the total specific surface area. So for every one milligram of absorbed iodine, roughly it translates to one square meter of surface area per gram of activated carbon. So the minimum iodine number for the activated carbon used in sorb seal is set at greater than 
1,000 milligrams per gram, which translates to around 1,000 square meters per gram. So once you've specified the properties of the activated carbon itself and how much is required per square meter of GCL based on the site and the project design requirements, um, how do you weave in a quantitative test for whenever it arrives on site to ensure that you've got the right amount of activated carbon inside the blended powder as specified? So 500 grams, 800 grams a kilo per square meter, et cetera. And that's where the percent carbon content test comes in. You can use either thermogravimetric analysis or TGA to quantify this, or you can use the quicker and cheaper, but by no means less precise muffle furnace test. You only need uh, one gram of the blended powder to run this test. So this can be easily extracted from the GCL samples sent to the independent lab for CQA analysis, assuming the lab has a muffle furnace that is. The result from the test can then be converted to the amount of activated carbon and also by extension, the amount of dry bentonite. And this is done using the calibration curve, which was developed based on a series of TGA and muffle furnace tests using the pure bentonite, uh, samples of the pure carbon, and also different blend percentages of each material. And to make things easier, we built a simple calculator for the labs. So that's the MQC lab, as well as the commercial labs carrying out CQA. And this is uh, helpful in calculating the percentage of each of these components. Further to this, Montmorillonite content analysis via XRD has been embedded in our industry for many years as a staple quantitative test for the bentonite. Now you can either choose to have an independent laboratory collect bentonite directly from the sampling points online during uh, production of the sorb seal product for your project, or you can send the blended powder from the GCL off to CSIRO and uh, they'll test the powder as a whole and give you two results, uh, an absolute abundance and a relative abundance. If you're simply interested in the Montmorillonite content of the bentonite, then the value which is uh, going to be reported will be the relative abundance value as this will have the activated carbon components subtracted. So to summarize, we talked about the history of chemicals and emerging contaminants, uh, the difficulty in managing and regulating these, how widespread they are, and a few of the health implications which can result uh, with exposure. We discussed the fact that historical chemicals such as DDT and asbestos, uh, while helpful generally were somewhat less challenging to regulate relative to PFAS as they were individual chemicals as opposed to a large group. We learned that even low doses of certain chemicals can affect our endocrine system and result in negative health outcomes. We saw that PFAS are ubiquitous in landfill leachates as they still exist in a wide range of products which we buy, use, and then discard. We looked at activated carbon in some detail and the ability of a certain type to absorb a range of PFAS. Then we discussed the development of sorb seal and its design from early lab trials through to a fully operational modified GCL manufacturing line, which uh, can be customized in the future as more research is completed on other types of powders and polymers. Uh, we then reviewed the hydraulic and PFAS attenuation performance of both a standard and hybrid GCL and then finally looked at the specification for sorb seal with a specific focus on the activated carbon component. So that concludes this webinar. I hope you found the content valuable and that you return to the Geofabrics Academy for more education around geosynthetics and their use and performance in real world applications.